Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. We are continuing with our lecture series DNA and Design and I sincerely hope that you have found the material interesting and informative and a cause for reflection. Um, I would like to uh, in these uh, next couple of lectures uh, tackle one more very interesting issue in the origin of life dilemma that I think once again makes a very, very convincing case for the necessity of intelligent design. And we call this issue the chicken and egg problem. So what exactly is the chicken and egg problem? Well, let us begin with a very, very brief review of how the information in DNA gets made into the critical proteins for life. The first step, if you remember, is transcription, where DNA is turned into RNA, specifically messenger RNA. And this process requires proteins. It, in fact, requires a lot of proteins. And in this slide, you're seeing just one of the main proteins called RNA polymerase that turns DNA into RNA. But the take home message is that the, trans the transcription of DNA to RNA requires proteins. In fact, the process of transcription requires a lot of proteins. It is a very complex process. You need proteins to unravel the DNA strands. You need proteins to uncouple the two strands from each other so that one strand can be transcribed. You need DNA bending proteins. You need the RNA polymerase, which is itself coupled to multiple transcription factors and mediator proteins. So many, many very, very specialized and specific proteins are required for this task. This slide shows an even um, more detailed view of the protein complex of RNA polymerase, a protein enzyme, the multiple activator proteins that hook into regions on the DNA known as enhancer regions, repressor proteins that silence other parts of the DNA, then multiple co-activator proteins that hook into the activator proteins and multiple other transcription factors. So hopefully now we are getting an idea of how complex and intricate and intertwined and coordinated this process is using multiple very specific functional proteins. Now, once the DNA is transcribed, well, now we have mRNA. But this mRNA is just sitting there it needs to be made into proteins, and that process is called translation. And once again, this is being taped during the COVID epidemic. And if you've been paying attention to the vaccine issue, the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, those are mRNA vaccines where an mRNA is injected and it uses the body's own translation machinery to make the viral proteins uh, against the COVID virus that will then incite an immune response. So I think we're now, uh, because of this epidemic, all very familiar with mRNA and with this process of translation of making mRNA into proteins. And this is done mainly by something called the ribosome. And the ribosome is a protein machine that takes mRNA and turns it into proteins. And so it turns out that this process of translation is also a very complex process that requires a lot of proteins. The ribosome is made of a large subunit and a small subunit 
each of which is made of multiple proteins. And those proteins work in conjunction with other proteins that syn synthesize something called transfer RNA, seen here as tRNA. And each of those transfer RNAs is itself very specific. It hooks into one of the 20 amino acids. So there are 20 types of transfer RNA. Uh, and it hooks into one of the amino acids on one end, and then it has a specialized foot plate that recognizes the codons on the mRNA at the other end. And so here you see one transfer RNA for methionine bringing in uh, the methionine and matching it to the codon for methionine on the messenger RNA. So again, these protein complexes that make the tRNAs are very, very specific. And there's a whole group of tRNA synthetases that work with the multiple proteins that make the large and small subunits of the ribosomes. Here is again a uh, little bit uh, more blown up schematic that is showing us these multiple uh, proteins interacting within the large and small ribosomal subunits. And so again, the take home message is that not only does transcription require a complex coordinates coordinated set of proteins, but translation also requires a complex and tightly coordinated set of proteins. So with this background, we're now ready to understand the chicken and egg problem. You remember the chicken and egg problem, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, you need a chicken to make an egg, but you need an egg to have made that chicken. So which came first? Well, this is exactly the same thing. You need DNA to make proteins. But this DNA is useless without all of the specialized proteins that function in transcription and translation. So how did those proteins arise? Because we need those proteins to have been there in the first place to not only make use of DNA, but to also replicate the DNA. We did not talk about the process of DNA replication, which is itself very complex, but DNA not only makes proteins, but it replicates itself for all of the cells in your body that are constantly dividing and for organisms that divide to make the next generation and so forth. So you need DNA to make proteins, but you need proteins both to replicate and transcribe and translate the DNA. In fact, the process we went over was still very simplified, and this transcription and translation requires over 100 coordinated proteins. So which came first? So let me try to drive the example home a little bit more if, if that didn't make uh, sense. Let's say, for example, that DNA contains the instructions to build the first fax machine. But the only way I can get you those instructions is to fax them to you. So I would need a fax machine to fax you the instructions to make a fax machine. Or think about it like a DVD disc player. And the information about how to build a DVD disc player is all stored on a DVD. But to access that information, well, I need a DVD disc player in the first place. And this is exactly the issue of the interplay between DNA and proteins. So not only is DNA very complex and proteins are very complex, but their tight coordination requires that they both would have been present in the very earliest life form. That very earliest life form could not make the necessary proteins for life without DNA, but that DNA could not be synthesized, transcribed, 
or replicated without those proteins in the first place. So if you don't have the DNA, you can't make the proteins. If you don't have the proteins, you can't make the DNA. And so this speaks very strongly to the need for an intelligent coordinated design to put them both together in the first place, to create the DVD and the DVD player all at once, because not any proteins will do. Even if by chance you were able to synthesize some functional proteins by a random mix of amino acids, and by chance you were able to synthesize some random um, nucleotide chains to make a DNA, uh, there would be no chance that you would uh, be able to couple one to the other in the cycle in which they are coupled. Because right from the beginning, you need both and you need them both to be functional and accurate and specific for the first life to even get off the ground. So that would seem to really close the case. We pound our gavel and say, case closed. Um, no materialistic, random, naturalistic process could have come up with this. You needed to create the chicken and the egg together. Uh, but there are hypotheses that do try to circumvent or solve the chicken and egg problem. And we will take a brief look at the one which has dominated uh, biological thinking and education for maybe close to two decades now. So if you're interested, stay tuned. Salaamu Alaikum.